Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to my studio. My name's Michael Markowski, and today we are going to continue the very, very fundamental basics of acrylic painting. And today we are going to actually get the paint out of the tubes, squeeze them out onto our palettes, and start mixing a color wheel. And I'm super excited for today's episode because over the past year and a half I have made 178 paintings so far so what I'm about to show you is a tried and tested 100% foolproof solution for a beginner artist an intermediate artist and even a professional artist like myself we have painted most of the greatest paintings in human history and we've used the same palette for every single one of them. And each one of them turned out pretty good. <laughs> Some of them may be better than others. But, uh, you know, it's sort of the way that all the recreation of all these paintings go. It's, you know, trying my best to sort of work like a detective back in time. Figure out, you know, the, the process of the artist. And then use my knowledge as a professional artist to try to recreate them. But using the simple palette that I'm about to introduce today, we can do anything with it. And next week, we're going to take it up to the next level. Today, we're going to start at the very, very basics. Okay, so let's, uh, let's look at sort of what we're about to cover today. This is our class number two. I don't think there's 10 steps. I think there's like six steps. So I think 10 to 16 or so. I just noticed as I was getting ready. So we're going to talk about how to, at the beginning, how to, how to get a drawing onto a surface, onto a canvas, a canvas board, which is what I'm going to be painting on, uh, or any other type of surface. Right? We talked about different types of surf surfaces last class, so you can watch the previous episode if you're wondering the different kinds of things you can paint on. You can paint acrylic paint on almost everything. Some will last longer than others, but not everybody wants to make a painting that will last you know generations right some people make art deliberately that will evaporate or disappear within hours anyway so we're going to talk about how to get an image onto a canvas and one of the things that i often use is this outline uh, transfer process we're going to talk about the colors and why we use those colors and then we're going to mix a very basic color wheel okay so the first thing that uh, we're going to talk about here is the importance of having a little bit of some a snack or, or kind of beverage to drink and and as you've if you've been watching me for a while you know that i love my tea and this is actually a mug that one of our um students part member of our community gave me for christmas this year charme thank you so much for this beautiful mug mm. and she also got me a laughably large amount of tea so i'll never need tea forever again anyway i'm a tea drinker i love tea i uh i used to drink a lot of coffee i switched to to, to tea about 20 years ago um but some people love their coffee i think having some type of a beverage to just keep you hydrated is a great idea water sparkling still whatever juice or here in canada we call it pop or at least Western Canada mostly. Uh, juices, smoothies, coconut waters, any kind of thing like that. And then if you're gonna eat some food, think about it being kind of like your the, the, a really great party snack, something that you don't even need a napkin to, to clean your, your fingers with because you don't wanna be getting stuff all over the place onto the picture. So below there, in, well, actually, let's just think about some some light little finger snacks like carrot, like little vegetables, carrots, apple slices, celery, cheese, yogurt, spring rolls, energy bars, pizza, 
at least if it's not super greasy pizza, you know, some something in a bowl you could use a fork with, fork or spoon, without splashing and making a big mess. So on the list down there below, um, I things that I would discourage would be alcohol and drugs, right? Which when I was a young art student, I was under the impression that these were prerequisites for becoming an artist and I have learned over the course of my career that the best artists, the artists that have long careers and are very successful are people that are generally sober when they're making their art. And I'm certainly, there's certain, probably lots of you are sitting there with a glass of wine going, hmm, I'm not sure about this. You know, I'm, I'm sort of talking, you know, to maybe the younger generation of artists, young people who might be watching this, who might have been under the same assumptions that I was, that you have to be like Jackson Pollock, holding a bottle of whiskey while you're splashing paint all over the place. I will just sort of quickly, mm, let me see. I want to show just a couple of resources. Um... I never talk about any of this stuff ever before. This is just a real quick mention here. Uh, if you've ever heard of Alan Carr, great book. Uh, and this one changed my life. Jason Vale, Kick the Drink. Essentially, just the, 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 the idea behind both of these books is that alcohol or any drug really is, it's a... Uh, a scam basically a big marketing scam and that they do not help you in any way whatsoever I always thought having a couple little you know like when I was younger I used to have a whiskey and I'd be painting and then I'd have a few more and after a few hours I was useless I couldn't get any more work done and I've started to kind of realize like oh all my favorite artists like the giants of art were pretty much stone sober the whole time they were making their art so anyway, that's the only time I ever mention or talk about any of that. So <laughs> I just wanted to put it out there because it's something that's important to me. My life changed when I stopped drinking. While I'm talking about a couple of books here, I just thought I'd also mention a few really great books that are about the art process. So Twyla Tharp's uh, The Creative Habit. This is a great book. You can see I got it at a used bookstore for 10 bucks. Um, it's really just about the different kinds of rituals and habits that artists can form to help them make um, a, a, a more structured approach to creating art. And that's similar to this book, Daily Rituals, um, by Mason Curry here. Daily Rituals, really this book is literally has very, like, very short chapters. They're each like maybe a page long. Like the the kind of the the rituals and habits of Sylvia Plath, right? So not just painters and writers. There's John Cheever, the author, um, and I just think it's really interesting just seeing how different artists organize their schedules and when they think the best time to paint or or write is. And then lastly, I'll just mention this because I talk about it all the time. Is this book Art and Fear, which I also assign to all of my students at Emily Carr, the university here in Vancouver where I teach at. It is a required book for my students there. I've mentioned this a few times and people have gone out and bought this book in our classes here online and people said, wow, actually, I love this book. So a lot of the, if you read this book, you'd be like, oh, I, I see where Michael gets some of his ideas. Uh, awesome book. David Bales and Ted Orland. They also came up with another book recently about sort of, I think it's called Beyond the Artist's Studio. Okay, so let's, uh, let's move on to the next step here. So step number 11 is getting an image onto the canvas. Now, this is the image that we want to... to get this is we're going to paint this image now if you just sort of look at that it's like there's a lot of lines and circles i'm not even sure how i'm going to like how are we going to do that i'm going to show you two different ways to go about doing this one of which is you can print this out and we can transfer this onto a canvas so i'm going to do that with some carbon paper 
if you're sitting here thinking like, oh, well, I guess I, I'm going to two note because I, I don't have a printout. Uh, so don't worry, I'm going to draw it for you and you can follow along and I'll show you how to get that onto the canvas too because there's all sorts of different ways that we can go about this. And I use this in almost every episode going forward so I think it's kind of helpful for you to see how it happens. So uh, let's just sort of maybe take a quick look where you can get this image. Or actually, even before I go there, I think it's worth sort of thinking about there's there's lots of different ways to make any artwork. So we have looked at some artists that that take a blank canvas and just start painting directly onto it. That don't do any sketching, don't do any drawing onto the canvas or the paper. They immediately just start painting. Um, a lot of like who would be a great ex well we looked at um, Berta Morisot, she, one of the most famous impressionist painters. She would just well not all the time but would generally just sort of paint directly onto the canvas and maybe paint outlines with a paintbrush to get started. Um, you know I guess like Jackson Pollock I just mentioned earlier a lot of the abstract expressionist painters the whole idea of of doing all this fine drawing before you paint on it is sort of anathema to that whole method. The whole idea is this, like, this intense expression onto the canvas. So it doesn't make sense to do too much drawing or any drawing whatsoever. So, you know, but on the other side, you have somebody like Henri Matisse or even Pablo Picasso. You, there's a, 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 a film called The Mystère de Picasso or the mis yeah the mystery of picasso i think in in english and it shows him painting a bunch of things on glass and you can obviously he's not he didn't draw on the glass he just starts painting directly so if you're if you're a master if you're really good or you want to sort of go right to abstraction and or expressionism you could paint directly onto the canvas another approach might be just to draw directly onto the canvas with a pencil right so here's your more maybe apprentice level perhaps so if you have a pretty good idea of what you want to do maybe you've got a sketch in your sketchbook some artists will take their sketchbook you know maybe just flip to the let's say this is just the page and they've got a drawing on here and they might sit there and kind of go like okay let's just refer to that let's draw this here and that might be one way to do that as well, right? Um, so, but again, that might take a little bit more practice. You might have to have a little bit more confidence in your drawing ability. If you want a little bit more confidence with your drawing ability, I did teach an entire 40, 45 or 40 episode intro to drawing course. It's free, just like this one on YouTube. There's a playlist in the description below. Again, I know lots of people have watched that and really enjoyed that. And I think knowing how to draw will dramatically help your paintings. But that's why I've done all these outlines because not everybody wants to learn how to draw. They just want to go right to the painting and having the outlines just allows you to cut right past the drawing process, go right to the painting. So if you're at the beginner level, using some type of process to transfer an image onto the canvas is a huge help, right? So um, let's look at where you can download if you haven't already joined the the Facebook group, there is a link to that. It's the first thing in the description below. I strongly encourage you to join our Facebook. There's like 50 people joined over the last week. Um, so, and I think right below that is the Dropbox folder. Now you're gonna see there are, I don't know, about a hundred folders in here and there will be more. But if we go right back up to the top here and we click in this folder, this is where we are you're going to see two files in here. One's a PDF and one's a JPEG. They're both identical. And in fact, I, let me see. Um, I forgot to open these up here. And <laughs> once we get that open, come on. There we go. 
So that's what this looks like. So you can you can download it from the Dropbox onto your desktop or your downloads folder and then print it out onto any type of uh, using an inkjet printer, laser jet printer. I tend to kind of, I like thicker paper, but it can be thin photocopy paper. The thickness of the paper is irrelevant. In fact, if anything, thinner paper makes this whole process easier. So if you've got the, uh, if you've printed this out, then the easy thing to do is take some tape. We're going to line this up. And then we can put some tape over top. Now, once we tape it down, we don't want to be moving the, the tape, right? Because we're going to put some carbon paper underneath it. So, this also, actually, you know what? I should have sanded this first because this is the, the actual canvas that we created last week when I put gesso on it, because I remember there was a few little things that fell off of my hands on here. So I'm just gonna use my 220 grit sandpaper and gently sand this quickly. Okay. I didn't really go too much or to the edges because we're, we're not going all over the whole canvas, so let's put this back in place. And then I'm going to take some of this carbon transfer paper. And if you don't have carbon transfer paper, there's still a way to do this. But I will, I'll show you that when I draw this image out here in a moment. So I'm going to trace that in just a second. But I thought I would show people, anyone who's watching right now, how to do this same image without any type of outline. Now I'm going to use, okay, that's a 7B pencil. That's really dark. Here's my preferred pencil, a B. But I'm just going to use a typical HB pencil here just to show you how to do this. Just back out a little bit so you can see the full piece of paper. So rather than drawing directly, I could, I can draw directly onto the canvas if I want. All right, so here's another blank canvas. I could just start drawing directly on this. But let's say I start making some mistakes and I start having to get the eraser out. Then all of those kind of marks start building up on this surface. My recommendation is just to take a, another piece of paper, just a regular photocopy piece of paper, and just draw a circle on here. Now you can, if you've got like a, a um, what should I call it? Like an old pail, like a, a for paint, you know, that fits on there pretty well. And you can just trace around that. And if you've got little your tubes of paint depending on what size they are these are going to be perfect for the circles so we'll just start we'll kind of get this something like that right next thing i'm going to do is i'm going to divide this in half right again it doesn't have to be perfect i mean if you want a really really nice perfect color wheel then you can download the template and trace it. But that's not really my goal here, right? So the first thing I'm gonna do is I wanna get all of these circles on here. Now we want 15 circles, which doesn't line up perfectly. So I'll show you how I do this. I'm gonna start with a circle on either side here. And then I'm gonna put one right on this line and one right on this line and then another one on this line okay and now i'm gonna so so these don't worry about numbering or anything of that just yet now we're gonna put two circles in between here and i'm gonna put two circles in between here Ok, 
okay? And now I'm gonna put three circles on either side here. So maybe I'll, we could put, we'll do it two different ways. Maybe we'll start one side, we'll go like this. And maybe the other side, we can show you if we just start with one in the center and then put one on either side. All right? And then we can do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. 12, 13, 14, 15. Okay? Because those are the, the 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 15 circles that we need, and the, really the the most important ones to get started are number five, six, ten, eleven, and one and fifteen. Because these are going to be where our yellows go, reds, and blues. Now you could certainly they. They can be anywhere, <laughs> but you know, you, so you could have the yellows here, the reds here, and the blues here. That doesn't, that's not really that important. And it's important to know that there are sort of infinite different types of color wheels that I've seen out there. But again, I've, I, I think I've proven how effective this whole process works. Now, this is enough for us to get started today, but you'll see that next class we're going to be painting in a bunch of these lines now this is you know this might appear to be really confusing essentially what we just want to think about doing is we want to connect the the different shapes together in fact if you're drawing you know what if you're drawing it like this i would suggest let's just stop there and then we can paint those things in next week. Because I think if we if we start drawing all those lines in there, it could get really confusing for some people. So, um, let me just show you, again, if you do not have carbon paper, then what I would do is I would flip this upside down, and then you can use just a regular HB pencil, and we can just go over top of this surface. Now, ideally, we might have something a little bit softer. So this is my 7B pencil. And a 7B pencil is going to leave a darker line that smudges easier and will also transfer easier. Okay. So in fact, you know what, Let, I'm gonna take another canvas here. I'll do sort of two really quickly. And I'll transfer this one onto here and you'll see. I hope I've done enough there. Let me just do a little bit more. Okay. So this will help me, like if I feel like my if I need to kind of make any mistakes, I'd rather make them on this piece of paper than on my actual painting itself. All right, so maybe here, just because those circles are a little bit bigger, I'll just tape off on the edges. And then I'm just gonna go around and pressing is pretty hard. Try to transfer these pencil marks over now they're not going to be as nice and sharp and dark as the ones when we use the carbon paper but it, it will do a reasonable job so i might have to once i've done this just take my pencil and go back over these lines all right so you see that boom didn't need anything except my canvas and a piece of paper. And in fact, probably if I was using a thinner piece of paper, this might have been even darker lines. Now, obviously, if I had made, you know, 
traced around a tube of paint. They'd be even cleaner. It would be, it would be a really beautiful, pretty image. But is that... Do you really, really need a pretty color wheel? Mm, I don't know. Okay. So that's how to do one of them. Now we've got one image here. We'll just show you how to do this one, which is just a little bit more complex. Although if you've got it, you, some people might say this is a much, much easier way of going about things, right? So remember, I've got my carbon paper underneath here and that pencil line drives me nuts. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay. So it doesn't matter where we start. You'll see that I'm going to use a colored pencil because if I'm going over these lines with another, you know, pencil like this, as I just did, as I say that, then you might be, it might be hard to remember exactly what lines you just went over. And there are words on the outline, which you can transfer if you want. If you want to, to get an exceptionally professional looking image, you could also transfer those. So this takes just a couple of minutes to do. And just want to make sure, okay, let's see, this is, I accidentally did it on the wrong side. <laughs> I always say, I get to make all the mistakes and you could get to watch me making mistakes at home. So there you go egg on my face. Let's do this all over again. You can also put the numbers in there if you like. I would probably put the numbers inside. That way it's pretty... Um, it's unlikely that you'll get them confused. If you put like number 13 here, it's like, is that 13 or is that 13, right? Now, one thing that you may notice, if you look very carefully at <clears throat> this uh, handout, is you'll see that there's also this lightly grayed out circle that can that goes connects between number one and five but there's a little space a gap between one and 15 you can see it goes between 11 and 15 but there's a little gap between 10 and 11 and also between six and ten but there's little gaps on either side right that's because we're going to mix these two colors or sorry that's because we're going to mix these two colors together to get these colors we're going to mix these two colors to get these colors. And we're going to mix these two colors to get those colors. This here, all the lines I'm about to do in the center, this is stuff we're going to talk about next week. But while I've got my outline on the page here, I might as well um, do this transfer process. So, I was planning on doing this this morning, and then I decided instead to go for a big long walk with my daughter. So, my apologies, but I had a great time <laughs> with my daughter. Okay, and uh, you know what? Let's uh, do I, let's write these words here. Might as well. I try usually to do all this, as I said, so that I can just speed through the, this transfer process at the beginning of an episode. But uh, so many episodes you'll see, if you look at the archive, have kind of this as just kind of I just zoom through all of this really quickly. Let's. Now my 
handwriting on its own can be atrocious so this might help me <laughs> but I don't know some of this this text is, is pretty small to actually paint for most people but if you want a challenge you could certainly do that now there's all of these lines here so I'm just gonna use a ruler just to quickly do that And I don't mind if the lines all cross over top of one another. Yeah, we're almost done this aspect of the of the painting. I'm telling you, we are going to have the most beautiful set of color wheels anyone's ever seen. I'm also so excited. This is really the culmination of maybe 20 years of, of my experience as an artist and a teacher coming together in this. This is like the most advanced color wheel version that I've, I've done or taught. So the, once you're done, I mean, what I should have done is just maybe flipped this up and just take a quick second to make sure everything's there before I peel this away. Now I save these just in case. You know, if you want to do another color wheel, then you have the option to do so. I'll also mention that these pieces of carbon paper, you can use many times. Like you can see there, I've used this many times. And the image has still turned out pretty good. Right, so originally when I first started using I thought you could only use it once and I would go through a ton of this stuff and it's not expensive but then when you realize oh I could use it maybe another 15 times okay well that's a good to know I wish I had known that before okay so let's just clear a little bit of space get all of this out of the way And lots of comments here. Oh, and I see the robot spammers are in force here. Um, wow, so many comments. Sandra's here. V Voice is here. Kathy says hello. Roxana is there. Hello, Roxana. I feel like a little kid going to school. I love that. Uh, Yed, oh, Yedis, you are a spammer. Let's get rid of that. By the way, I wouldn't click on any <laughs> advertisements or anything you see in there. It's usually somebody trying to sell you some scam, right? Uh, <laughs> Pascal's not going to um, use a mug for drinking and or, or for mixing your... Why don't I just read your comment? <laughs> Pascal says, hello everyone, don't use regular mug for paint washing water. Don't want to mix cups when drinking. <laughs> That's, I love that, yeah. Uh, Joe Walzer says, absolutely love this channel. Thank you so much. Uh, Sandra says, Daily Rituals was a great read. Easy too, highly recommended. Heidi says, hi everyone. I've been wanting to paint the color wheel on canvas so I could hang, hang it up. My last one more than a year ago was in a sketchbook. Awesome. Cool. Uh, Sandy says, is it frozen? Uh, I don't know. It seems I, I don't see any warnings from YouTube. So, oh, and there's a bunch of there's Donna's there, Deborah's there. Wow, everyone is here. Cool. Okay, so let's let's get back to the matter at hand. So now, once we've got this image on the on the canvas or paper, because you could be doing this on on a sketchbook as well. Let's talk about getting paint on the palette. So we are going to start squeezing paint on. And next, well actually, you'll have to sort of take <laughs> what I'm talking about at face value and then over the next few episodes, all the reasons why we're using some of these tubes of paint. Because I think if I just start explaining this particular palette in too much depth, it uh, might get overwhelming for some people, for beginners. So 
essentially what we're going to be using for just today is two yellows, two reds, and two blues, right? In the last, the previous episode, we talked about my recommendations for which colors those should be to get the, the most effective results. But essentially what we're using is called a split primary palette. So a split primary palette is sort of what it suggests that we have, um, we're, we're using a primer, quote unquote primary colors, but we're splitting each primary into two, one cold and one warm. So here we have a warm yellow and a cool yellow. We're, we have a full episode dedicated to um, to understanding what warm and cool colors are. So I really I'm not going to go too deep into that whole concept today, um, because again, that might just be it'll it's it's just not really important at this stage. You just have to trust me that it will work. Okay. And so again, we have a cool red and a warm red, a cool blue and a warm blue. And yeah, I keep wanting to just like sort of dive in here, but you know what? Let's just, let's just keep it simple like that. So this is the paint that I put on my palette every single time that I set out to make a painting. Very, very simple palette. And this split primary system, we can make virtually any color that has ever existed with just these six colors. If we add white to it, I mean, well, we need white to, to, to reach many of those colors, but essentially we can get all the basic hues in here, including our greens, our oranges, and our purples, violets, right? And we can also mix our own browns, skin tones, and black without any additional colors, which is will blow your mind when we do this next week. This might just seem pretty straightforward for a lot of you, and if it seems straightforward, then it makes me so excited because when I was just starting out learning, I this was not how painting was introduced to me. I was sort of told that there were multiple different kinds of palettes that you would want to use if you wanted to do a portrait, if you wanted to do a modern portrait or a classical portrait. If you wanted to paint like Rembrandt, there would be a different set of colors. If you wanted to paint like Caravaggio, there would be a different set of colors. If you want to paint like Picasso or, and so on and so forth. And then if you want to go and paint landscapes, oh, you want to paint a sunny landscape or a winter landscape or, I mean, and there'd be different colors and different paint tube names for each one of those. And my eyes just glazed over instantly. Here, we just have these six and we can do anything with these six. Now, is it the same? Is there going to be some small differences? Of course, right? But for a beginner artist, you probably won't notice the difference. And also, I think if we start this way, it's going to make it so much easier to understand all of those different types of palettes that exist out there that all sorts of other artists use, right? So once we get this paint on here, um, let me just see here. We've got, um, I'm going to share on this next step here, something that I often do at the beginning of my paints uh, when I make a painting. So you do not have to do this. I just thought I would introduce another concept to people right off the bat. So one of the things that I like doing is adding what's called an imprematura. And the imprematura, it's a very fun word to say, the imprematura is a 
600-year-old approach to painting that artists kind of before the Renaissance were using. And it has a whole bunch, there's a, lots of different reasons to use this approach. Now, you could just paint directly onto this canvas, but since this is, I just want to introduce a concept, I'll just show you a little bit about how this works. So the idea is to cover the surface the white surface with a little bit of some type of a color. Now, I'm not gonna use any other color here. I'm actually just gonna use a little bit of white. And I'm gonna add just a little bit of water in here. And this is the only time I ever use water when I'm making a painting. The only time. Let me repeat that. This is the only time I ever use water with acrylic paint unless I'm cleaning my brush this is the only time I do it so I'm gonna mix a little bit of this white into some water just to dilute it because it's to stain the canvas now usually I actually add all sorts of other colors in here but I just thought I would show you a little bit about how this works because one thing that's nice about using this process is we can kind of seal our pencil marks in so that they become, um, they're kind of protected from all of the paint that we're about to put over top of it. We can also kind of slightly hide the pencil marks a little bit. So in, if, if we wanted, we could cover this, you know, have maybe a less diluted uh, um, white here, or even, you, if you try to paint white directly over top of this, you would probably just cover up all of the, the, uh, the pencil marks, and you wouldn't be able to see them anymore, which would sort of defeat the purpose of having done your drawing. But if you did it kind of subtly enough, we might obliterate the the pencil marks enough that you might be the only person who can actually see them. All right, that's pretty good. I'm wondering if I want to do that to the other one. The other one is there. Um, I think that's okay. That's just a, a quick little introduction. Now, I, most people, I would probably say, if you're sitting at home, you're like, do I need to do this? You don't need to do this at all but you will see me doing this quite often in the future with color rather than just white. So I thought I'd kind of just throw this out here. Um, Roxana says, would you do the same on your sketchbook? That's a good question. If you're painting your sketchbook, probably not. It wouldn't, I don't think it would make at, at least for this exercise, right? Because this is just an exercise, not really a, a finished painting. But certainly when we do more finished artworks, this might be a good idea. Even if you're painting in your sketchbook or on paper. Like, for instance, you're going to see me using this yellow. This is my warm yellow right out of the tube with a little bit of water painted onto paper. This is the paper the type of paper that I'm using for the graphic novel that I'm currently illustrating. And this is sort of this, I prime all the paper with this yellow. But anyway, we'll talk about that in a future episode. But yes, you can do it if your paper is, your sketchbook paper is thick enough. So I'll let this dry for just a few minutes here, just while we sort of talk about the, the reasons why someone might want to use an imprimatura on the canvas. Again, I love saying that word, which is why I say it all the time. Um, so we talked about, you know, protecting the pencil lines from smudging, but I really think one of the main reasons that I love using this process is because it just kicks the painting into right off into full gear, right? Instead of looking at the canvas as this blank thing that have, that's terrifying us, where do we begin? Boom, colors on there, painting has begun. It's no longer a question of, oh, which paintbrush, where does it go? It has already started, right? The train has left the station. 
we don't have to worry about that first brush stroke because we've just started it big bold stroke right and that just can feel really nice right at the beginning of a painting if we use um the the warm yellow that i typically use for all of my paintings then you get this really nice warm kind of kodachrome color this glowing warmth that comes out of the painting or at least appears to be coming out of the painting it's not actually the radiating radiation it's just an illusion and I, f I f really have fallen in love with that uh, another thing is if we put any type of color over the surface we stain it with a color then instead of little bits of white of the canvas shining through then we see that color and Personally, that is far more desirable than seeing little specks of white of the canvas showing through. That's just a personal preference, but you'll also see that putting that color on just immediately gives the painting this kind of classic look. It, it makes it look professional. I, it's just maybe it's because artists have been doing this for 600 years that it just sort of we all of a sudden like, oh, that looks like a painting that's in a museum maybe that's the case so maybe if we if we had 600 years where artists weren't doing it and we did do it it would look strange and funny but that's the world that we live in right and not every artist does it but certainly a large number of them do especially historically and then just sort of lastly the whole reason I think initially artists were putting this in Playmatura down is that it start it saves time actually because often Artists use a, a yellow or a kind of rusty reddish brown color in portraits for faces, skin tones, hair, uh, for landscapes. When you're painting trees and grass, you often want to have a little bit of brown and, and yellows and reds in those greens, right? So again, we're going to explore this and talk about it more in depth as we start actually making our own paintings based on all of these great master artists in the future but i just thought that that would be helpful to to point out okay so to help speed this process up having a hair dryer is very helpful right so here's just i got um yeah this one i think i got from the salvation army for like seven bucks um my wife wasn't happy with me using hers even though I use a hairdryer for my mustache now, um, but having an old, just any kind of hairdryer, it doesn't have to be super powerful. In fact, you probably don't want one that is super powerful because it can blow things off your table. So just something that can help speed this drying process up. And most of the time, acrylic paint, when you buy it, has, you know, it will dry matte, right? It'll dry non shiny and that's what's if you can look at the side of your painting right now or i guess if you've done this which probably most of you have not i can see what is wet in fact let me just tilt this up here so can you see how it's we can see some reflective shiny areas here that tells me the that area is still wet and if i touch it i'm gonna get paint in fact let me just touch an area here right so there's some paint that comes off and i don't want that mixing into my colors so i'm just going to blow dry this really quickly here so i'm just going to mute the microphone for about 10 seconds Okay. Time to have a little sip of tea. Mmm. Okay. So. Oh, I guess I should just. Here, I've got a list of why we want to use a hair dryer. Speeds up the drying time. And also, a hair dryer could be really useful if we're doing kind of experimental techniques with paint if we want drips to happen it's one way to help control those drips to either make them drip more 
or to stop them dripping, to, to try to dry them quickly when they get to the desired place. One little thing just to keep in mind if you're using a hair dryer is, like I notice when I use it a lot here that my cutting mat can start to warp and kind of bend a little bit. The cutting mats I usually find uh, will re return to their original shape afterwards. But one thing, you know, if you do have, let's say, a glass of wine or something with water in it, you're using a styrofoam cup to, to clean your brushes in, which I just told you not to do. But if you do it anyway and your mat starts to warp, it is possible that it could actually cause something like that to tip over. So just kind of be have that in mind and if you're gonna if you're painting on your kitchen table and you're using a, a blow dryer you could end up melting the finish on your table or you know heating it up to to a point where you can actually smudge it a little bit right so if you love wood i love wood i like taking care of wood i used to be a carpenter right you just want to be careful of the surface you're painting on and then kind of lastly there if you're not, I've done this here on one of these episodes where I yanked the cord and it pulled a cup and knocked a cup over. So you just want to make sure that you're, that it's not going to snag something and knock anything over, right? Anytime we've got all of these tools out on the table. So let's move on to painting the outside of the color wheel or what I call the rim of the color wheel, right? So we have we literally think of this as a tire here's our rim around the outside so we're going to paint these colors so the numbered color the numbered colors here are the the most intense saturated colors that we can get with these particular tubes of paint that we've chosen and it is true that paint manufacturers today have made paints that are even more intense than the colors that we're going to use like fluorescent um, colors what, uh, what's another name I've seen um, I've seen some called like vivid yellow or vivid red which are intended to be super saturated colors that are uh, that that or do not exist anywhere in nature except if there's maybe a particular type of a highlight on an apple for instance but anyway paint manufacturers will make anything and they'll see if anybody will buy it but so it is possible to get even stronger more intense colors on the outside but I don't think we ever need them and if we were to paint with them they, they look very strange if you're trying to paint anything natural so you just want to be careful so here we're going to paint the outside most saturated colors today next class we're going to paint within the color wheel the inside of the color wheel or what i call the spokes of the color wheel and that is when we start getting less intense less saturated colors and the closer colors approach to the center of the color wheel or what is known as the neutral core, the the uh, the more they approach a gray or brown. Uh, if they're if, if we don't have any white in there, then they basically turn black. And when we add white to it, they go black. Or when we add white to it, they go gray. But we'll cover that next class, right? So let's get started here. For um, and I just thought you know it might be worth just mentioning. This is really the only, remember I, I mentioned just a little while ago, but this is, I just want to keep this in mind. We want to try to avoid using water when we're painting with acrylics. Now I've done it, and if you watch some of the earlier episodes, I have done it because I know a lot of people use water compulsively. And so I'm always kind of interested, can we make something if we are constantly using water? And you can, but if you start adding water to your acrylic paints, then you're basically painting like a watercolor painting, right? And you're not using the acrylic paint as it's intended. And if you want to add water to, for various different reasons, because you want the paint to be a little bit thinner uh, so that you can get kind of more smooth brush strokes, then instead of adding water, you want to add a medium of some kind. And in, if, in fact, if anything, if you if you really 
if you really wanted to get a really nice um, thin paint, instead of using these types of paints, which are known as heavy body acrylics, right? So they're, f they're thick paint, right? Like the paint on my palette here, which I just put my thumb into, right? And I can tip it upside down here and I could probably leave this like that for, I, in fact, I don't know if that paint would drip off. I would, I, it would be an interesting experiment if, if I wanted, I could just drill this to the ceiling and just come back tomorrow morning and see if anything's dripped down onto the surface. But I don't think anything's gonna, I mean, I could really shake it to make it come off, but I don't think that's gonna happen. On the other hand, fluid acrylics, right, which you can hear is literally fluid. And it, if you want those really nice, fine, thin brush, brush strokes that, that, um, uh, that if you're doing really fine work, probably a fluid acrylic is your best bet rather than adding water to it, right? And I know there's lots of people that, that have been watching me for a couple of years that, that use water regardless, and they're able to do some pretty good stuff with it. But I think it's probably, I would think it's just causing more frustration than it would actually be of any benefit. Uh, okay, so let's select a paintbrush, right? We got our paintbrushes out last time. You can use whatever paintbrush you want for this next step. I'll just let you know. Here's So here's maybe kind of two typical brushes. Here. Now that we're right about to... Okay, so you know here we have a typical round brush, right? Which has got a nice kind of point to it, right? And then we've got some of these square brushes. Personally, and I mentioned this last episode, I these are my preferences. Unless I'm doing fine detail, I'm not personally as I don't use these type of brushes so much. And when you get a set of brushes in in a pack, you'll often find they come like. There might be 10 brushes, and let's say randomly there be, might be 10 brushes in a pack, maybe eight of them will be round brushes, and there might be just a few like this. So if I would probably just have go and buy some of these separately, if not, because I like how they work, but that's just personal preference, that just the way that the paint um, is can be um, applied works well for me. Okay, so let's get going here so what we're gonna start we're gonna work our way around the color wheel so we're gonna start here with our warm yellow so I'm gonna take some warm yellow on my paintbrush and I'm just gonna paint this right in here into number one and you can also you can apply it very thin, but you may also want to think about adding like a little bit of a blob in there, just so you can see what it looks like when it's um, a little bit thicker versus a little bit thinner. So maybe I'm just gonna leave a little bit of texture here. I don't think that's showing up on camera very well. You can see that. Just allowing a little bit of extra paint to accumulate there. Let me just do this one here as well. Now acrylic paint as it dries it has a, a self-leveling property, which means it will generally sort of lose some of the, the peaks and texture. Not all of it, but it will lose a little bit of it as the paint dries. So if you do want to keep a lot of that texture, then you may want to think of, again, using some type of medium to mix into the paint. Okay, another span. Okay. 
Um, Sandra says, I have over the cabinet hair dryer rack to hold my hair dryer on my easel that I got from Home Goods. It's very useful. I use the extra basket to put towels in. That's smart. Yeah, anything that's kind of out of the way, I think is very, very helpful. Okay. So, what I want to do now is I want to work my way. Maybe let's start out a little zoomed out here. Let's start here. I want to work my way from my warm yellow towards the warm red. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to mix a little bit of warm red paint into my warm yellow. Okay. Now, so let's I'm going to take some warm yellow. I'm just going to mix this to the side here. You can mix directly onto here, but it's probably a one of the uses of a palette is for mixing paint, not just for holding the paint, but for mixing your paint in there. So let's, I'm gonna zoom in here because I think it's helpful to see how much paint I'm actually going to use here. So I'm gonna dip my paintbrush into the paint. All right, you can see there's a little bit of paint in here and then I'm gonna blend it in. You can see I barely put any paint on my paintbrush and look how it changed so quickly Right that was maybe like five grains of salt worth type of amount of paint I'm gonna move that away I'm gonna paint this In number two here So the point is to be able to see that it's similar, but a little bit different. In fact, I'm just going to add to paint that little connector. And let me do this to this one as well here. When I teach this in person, what ends up happening is a number of there's two things that happen sometimes people do this and they literally put barely any red in there whatsoever like it they put on maybe one grain of salt and the color does change but barely like no. so when they do this there's there they can't really see any difference and i like that learning how to be subtle i think is really important with the color but it can get to the point where we want to have a little bit more and then the other thing i often see is people just go scoop and then it just goes red and you're like whoa just hold off and if you put too much red in here okay then just stop clean your brush and try it again in a different place because you're gonna have to use a whole tube of paint to lighten that up with more yellow than it will be just to start it all over again okay so let's now take a little bit more of this red right that's much more in fact maybe that's too much right so maybe i'm gonna instead take a bit more of this yellow and just move it off to the side because what i like doing is kind of mixing and then if i need more i kind of jump back in here so i feel like maybe that's more of what i want orange all right and here we're turning this in here a little bit of texture just to see because basically what I'm trying to show is how that color looks when there's layers of paint because if we did this we let it dry and we paint it over top of it those colors would actually change slightly again as well okay let's just do, add this Okay. 
Okay. Now let's just keep on going. So let's actually put this down here. So maybe I'll take a little bit more of this yellow just to be sure. And let's add more red to this. Because now we started with... Maybe I'll just mention here. We started with 100% warm yellow. Then we added maybe... 95% warm yellow and 5% warm red. And then here we went roughly 50-50. Maybe a little bit more warm yellow technically. Otherwise it's going to, because the red is so dominant. So it might be maybe 60% warm yellow, 40% warm red. But now what we're doing is we're, we want to go the other way. We want to have maybe maybe not quite 95 percent red yellow but we're, we want to be let's say 70 percent warm red to yellow so we're getting something it's much more of a warm or a, a red orange as it's called okay <laughs> I'm trying to do it kind of pretty, but uh, you can see it's not turning out super, super pretty. And that should just sort of be, a, you know, a um, an example for some people who, who are obsessed with perfection is that it doesn't have to be perfect, especially not our initial color wheel. Okay, and now I'm going to wash my brush because I don't want any yellow for this next step. I want it to be pure warm red. So I'm just gonna clean my brush off. Okay. And then now, let's zoom back in I'm just going to take my warm red right out of the tube and I'm going to paint that Now, if you do this and you notice like, whoa, you know, the there's quite a leap between any, any one of these colors, then you could certainly paint it, go back and, and try to add a little bit more of one or the other. If, however, let's say this one here turned out, you know, you paint it, you add way too much red and it looks like this one right here. All right, you're like, oh, adding more yellow to it, even after it's dry, it's, it's, you're going to have to use a whole tube of paint to really lighten it up. I would just paint some white paint right over top of it, let it dry, use the blow dryer, and then mix it and paint over top of it afterwards. Because it's not really going to, it's just going to be a little bit, um, uh, it, it, it'll just, it's so much easier to do that. Uh, I also just want to add, just for the sake of what I'm doing here, I'm just going to add a little bit more of this on top of my warm red. For this little area in here so that we've got a little bit of a tiny amount this is like that this little area here that's my 95 percent warm red five percent warm yellow just to complete that arc okay there's the beginning 
So now I can wash this brush. I can clean it right off because I'm not going to be um, painting with my warm yellow or my warm red for the remainder of today's class. So we're going to move on to our purples or violets down here at the bottom of the color wheel. So let's take a moment here to sip some tea. Now, you'll as a, again in the template that you that I, I provided, in fact, let's go back to that template. Remember where I said that there's this little gap between five and six, my warm red and my cool red. Now, there are colors that do exist in between here, right? How do I, do I want to get too far down a rabbit hole? Let's just, let's just keep it. I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm super fascinated with color and I've spent years doing research with it and um, it's fascinating that there's still in today's day and age um, some pretty fierce disagreement over how to mix a color wheel how to how to um, how color works and how our eyes and brain perceive color so um, anyway let's uh, so what I want to do here is I want to now move on so we're instead of painting any more warm red down here we're gonna go move on to our another red a second red this is my cool red or magenta and it is very cold so cold of a red that it already kind of it leans towards purple already on its own Right, so when you can you can see on camera that it sort of glows, it almost has like a pinkish kind of quality. Right, so magenta is is a color that is used a lot in the printing process. So often, um, if you've heard of CMYK, which is a printing, um, uh, which are the colors and the and sort of the process used for for a lot of um, book publishing or any any printing really you have cyan which is blue which is the blue that we're going to use for our cold blue you have magenta for M Y for yellow and K for black <laughs> and it's not CMYB but CMYK I, I'm, I'm, I can't remember exactly why they named it K I think it was because they didn't want to have a confusion between blue and black anyway one of those kind of funny things okay so now we're you can see I'm not gonna put a little line here because I don't want to confuse myself or you that these colors are mixing at all although I have done paintings where I do mix those two colors the two reds together if I want to get a red that might exist in between those two because technically the reason why I've chosen these colors is they actually are a little bit of a gap more of a gap that I'm presenting here on this diagram and we'll see that maybe even more specifically when we get to the blues that's probably where the biggest actual gap between these colors happen but we can we can bridge that gap just by mixing those two colors together so I'm not gonna wash my brush let's continue so what I'm gonna do now I'm gonna take my cool red my magenta and I'm gonna mix it with my warm blue which is generally a um, ultramarine blue so let's take some of this uh, magenta red my cool red and in fact let's zoom down in here so we can see let's make sure it's in focus there we go so just like we did with the yellow and the red, I'm going to take a little bit of blue. 
right? It's almost comically small amount because that blue is going to change that red very quickly, right? So we got this little bit of blue in my paintbrush, right? Let's take it and then let's mix it here. Oh, and that color just starts to change a little bit. And you can see I also rotate the paintbrush in my hand. And by rotating it, it helps get any extra paint that might have kind of climbed up the bristles of the paintbrush. So let's just move that out of the way. And paint here number seven. So it just looks ever so slightly different than the magenta, the cool red. But now it's got a little bit more of a purple quality, right? Or you might even say it actually almost looks even more magenta, right? Because it's pulling that cold color over this way, right? So let's do this again. Let's do the next step here. Uh, so my uh, Viv, Viv Voice says, is, is this the Cerulean or the Ultramarine? This is my Ultramarine Blue, my warm blue. In fact, you know what I should have mentioned, I forgot to do, is immediately upon getting your tubes of paint, I would literally write down on them warm right and cool right so labeling the paint that way when i say cool colors warm warm blue or red warm blue or cool blue you can just reach for that without even having to think about it you can just see like here's my cool blue right just reach right for that great question thank you for I love the questions because the questions, I'm sure m there's literally thousands of people who will have the exact same question as you. So the more questions I get, the, the I want to be able to try to make this as comprehensive as possible. So that's a great question. Thank you. So let's continue. Let's now take a healthier dose of uh, our warm blue. And again, I put it to the side and I don't mix it directly in. And now let's add this, bring more of the magenta into the color. That warm blue really makes a change very quickly to that color. So just want to be careful about adding too much too quickly. That's why I like having them kind of off to the side. If I need more, I just scoop a little bit more into my mixture. Okay. So right now this has a kind of a, a quite dark purple, but if we were to add white to this, it would it would be a beautiful, beautiful purple. Now I see I forgot to do one of these here, so I'm just gonna put this color in between. In fact, you know what, let's just, I just want to show, so for instance, I want to, I, I missed this space here, so I want to jump back. I want to show you, like, if I took this paintbrush that I have a lot of paint, this purple on right now, to get it back to this color, I'd have to put a lot more red into it. To lighten it up enough. Right, I might even need just a bit more magenta in here. Because the blue, any dark colors are quite dominant colors. So, let me see. Okay. 
Okay. So let's move on here. So we've got now our, this color is about 50-50, cool red and warm blue. So we want to mix. Now we want to have mostly blue with just a little bit of magenta, cool red in there. So I'm taking a lot more of my warm blue, mixing it in here. And now we get like a, a pretty deep purple or what's called a blue purple. All right. So this color is the same color like of for, you know the Los Angeles Lakers or LA Kings but they for whatever reason they call Forum Blue because they used to play in the, the LA Forum I think it's still very purple I don't know if I would call it blue but um, anyway so there we go now I'm going to in fact I'm just going to continue that little line now I'm going to wash this paint off because I'm just going to paint my warm blue in space number 10. And I should also mention, you know, since V Voice mentioned, like, or, you know, if, uh, is this, the, am I using the right blue here? If you do make a mistake, and I, when I do these in person, there's always two or three people in the class. You're like, oh, I mixed the wrong, I put the, ah. It's totally fine. Now, for our purpose, I think you, you'd probably be work well just to paint those areas that you've, you've made your quote unquote mistake out. Just paint some white, use a blow dryer, dry it out, and then try it again. Because this, we're gonna refer to this color wheel many times and you know, like some of you just mentioned, I want to have one that looks really nice so that I can keep on my studio wall or on my table so I can refer to it all the time. So I think it is really helpful and important that it is quote unquote correct, right? Um, but I wouldn't panic about it, right? And and don't feel like you're you're an idiot because you, you couldn't mix it. Everyone gets confused at this stage right it's that's just totally normal right we're, we're you're learning something completely new and I'll it, it might also just be the way that I'm explaining it so no problem so let's now take our warm blue my ultramarine blue I'm just gonna take it right out of the tube and I'm gonna paint that in number 10 here I forgot to do that on here as well. So, I have to mix my previous color up again. And when you're done painting this blue, again, we can wash our brush. The, the last time I did this um, this whole session, this particular episode, we used, as I was painting, we made a kind of a second color wheel, and um, some of the feedback I got from people was like, you know what, it's just getting too complicated. So I'm trying to do this as simple as possible. 
I love the feedback from people. I want this to be as, as good as it possibly can be so that more and more people get involved in painting. Okay, there we go. Look at that. Okay, yes, um, thank you. Uh, so Roxana says, I am one of the ones that is confused with the colors. Based on the color names, could you tell us which one is the warm one and which one is the cool one, please? Okay, so thank you. Okay, so let's, um, did I put this? Let me go. I guess that maybe I should. Hmm. Okay, so I, I'm just what I'm doing is I'm just looking at the the acrylic paint. I guess it would have been helpful if I had written down here which one was the warm and which one was the cool. That is that. So I'm, currently, what I'm doing is I'm editing all of these down right now. That's what I was doing last Thursday. So I'm gonna add that to the edited version of these. So when I'm talking about these paints right here. The primary yellow is my cool yellow. The Azo yellow deep, that's my warm yellow. The primary magenta is my cool red. And this naphthol red medium is my warm red. The primary cyan is my cool blue, and the ultramarine blue is my warm blue. So we can you can even write these down on your on the the uh, the chart. In fact, maybe I'll do an, an I'll I'll update that version of the PDF for in the future. I'll, I'll do a, a version of that which I'll upload over the next couple of days. Again, I love all these questions. I, let me know if that answers your question, Roxana. Um, Pascal says, we may need the pigment code on Amsterdam brand or, I don't know, using latex, liquid text here, I think I am a bit darker between cool red and ultramarine blue. Maybe I have a wrong cool red. Okay. That is great. Um, well, it's not. I mean, that's frustrating for you, but uh, okay. That's a good little quick segue right here in the middle, because so here's an example. I I do this exact same thing if I buy new paints, different. So these are. Um, what brand? I'm trying. I did this with acrylic paints a few years ago, when I was traveling, and I was doing a bunch of paintings on the road, and so I bought new paint while I was away, and I did. Uh, this is actually this is the one that I, I started with, so I bought new paint, and the, everything here, all of these colors, all of this looks exactly fine, but just like you, maybe Pascal. I came to my uh, reds down here, and it turned out that I used a red that was maybe a little bit in between my warm red and my cool red. It wasn't quite cold enough, it was kind of still right about in the middle. And what happened is, when I mixed what I thought was my cool red with my warm blue, you can see that the resulting purples looked kind of very brown, right? Not as saturated of purples as I had hoped. So that was the that's the benefit of doing a color wheel. Even if you think you're a super smart person and you've been painting for decades, as as I was I don't know if I think I'm a super smart person, but I've been painting for decades. I just did this a few years ago and then I was like, whoa, that's not the color I want. So the next day, I went out to the art supply store, got a different red, a more magenta red, and you can see the difference. 
All right, let's just look at these side by side because it is pretty startling. Maybe I'll put this one on this side, this one here. The, the difference between using one color over another can just throw the whole color wheel out of whack. Having said that, there might be some people who would prefer this. They, that maybe they don't use purple, they don't want a really saturated purple. So they, they might be like, you know what, I like this. In fact, this is probably much closer to what we would call like a classic color palette. Like the kind of colors that someone like Rembrandt would have used. In fact, he, pro he would not have had, he would have had ultramarine blue, but probably not as saturated as this ultramarine blue. So he, he would be limited to these colors. This is a much more modern palette, but it allows, we can still get these, the same colors. I can still mix these colors because you can see they're right in here, right? They're just getting closer. This is just, instead of having a very saturated rim of the color wheel, outside it, it's much more desaturated, especially down here. Hope that answers some questions. Those are, that, that, I mean, that's great. I, I totally forgot about that. So thank you. Um, okay. Um, Pascal says, yeah, that's like mine. It's even darker. Uh, Ace17 says, it would be interesting to see the color wheel with only cyan, magenta, and yellow as compared to the double primary wheel. Okay, so that's another good point here, is when I first started teaching, that's exactly what I did. I just used a, a I think I, I used a warm red, so I used a warm red, I think I probably used the cool yellow, and probably the blue that would exist in between these, which is a cobalt blue. So I did do that. That's how I used to teach painting 15 years ago. And immediately the reactions I would get from people are, why are my purples, why do my purples look like this? And I would say, well, we can just add a little bit more white in there and we'll get a nice purple. But people would not be satisfied until finally I was like, you know what? I think a split primary palette is far more effective. Can you get away with just using three colors, a, a, a one red, warm yellow, one blue? Yes, there are lots of artists that do that. Personally, I would like to have all of the options available to me. I want to be able, like with this palette, again, I can mix every single color that the human eye can perceive. Maybe there's 1% of the color spectrum I cannot quite get, and I might not be able to get them in quite the the luminous, super saturated the, as I can, maybe with some pigments that are made directly from the, the factory, but we can get really, really close. So personally, I wanna be able to do absolutely everything I, I wouldn't want to limit my palette but there are artists out there um, we talked about do I have his book here okay so while we're talking about this here's a, an artist I, I love James Gurney I did a whole episode focusing on James Gurney and we painted um, this castle in the clouds when we did that maybe two, three months ago. He's an awesome painter. He's also a YouTuber. He created this series called Dinotopia. Awesome. This is his, like, how to paint book. But I'll just sort of show you, since we're talking, this kind of has come up a few times, that he, he, he shows in here a number of different types of palettes. So maybe it's worth just sort of looking at this color wheel in here. So what he's doing is kind of showing us, let's make sure that's in focus here, where different colors exist in the spectrum, right? So we have, you know, like ultramarine blue down here. You can see that the color wheel's flipped than what I have here. So he's got his blues on this side, his reds on this side, and the yellows up here. 
So it could be a little confusing for people, but here's your ultramarine blue, the the reddish, because there's different ultramarine blues. You might have a, this is violet oriented, whereas this is a blue oriented. So we're probably using a more generic ultramarine blue, which exists a little bit in between, right? And you can see it's not all the way to the edge. There, Like I said, there's more saturated colors that you can get, but they're really expensive and very rare and, and very new. Colors that didn't even exist 10 years ago, right? So if we mixed this with our, here's our magenta over here. So you can see that there are other colors that exist, you know, between these, we've decided to pick these two. So here's our magenta. Where's our, here's our naphthol red over here. Very saturated red. Our warm yellow, I think it's probably, it's not right here, but you probably want a cadmium yellow light, which is, well, I guess there's cadmium, well, cadmium yellow medium, I think is somewhere around here. That's the kind of warm yellow we want. And then we've got come over here, Our the yellow we're using is like a Hansa yellow, even though they, this brand calls it a primary yellow, right? So again, there's a gap between these two yellows, just as there was a gap between my cool red and my warm red. And then if we move um, over here, here's my cold blue. Right, so look at this huge gap between all these greens. Right, and so when we mix our yellow and blue together, we're sort of cutting across here. So you can buy more saturated greens and we can mix, but I strongly discourage that kind of thing until you become more and more familiar with how to use just color in general. Because that's what I did after a while and my paintings just became brutal they, because none of the colors were gelling they're all just random colors thrown into the mix so anyway I just want to show that color wheel and then I think he's got some color palettes in here I mean like so he's got this list uh, like so he even suggests a two color palette I'm using six he's talking about using two color palette of phthalo blue which is pretty close to our cool blue and orange, right? So imagine if, if we'd started here and I said, okay, why don't you go get raw umber and cobalt blue and rather like, it just gets very confusing very quickly. But here's a bunch of different color palettes he suggests that you could use, right? Here's basically talking, I think what you just mentioned, Ace 17 is like trying to do a whole palette here. I think he's got, you know, here's like all of these um, different palettes that we can use. Anyway, probably for our purpose, a little bit down the rabbit hole, but there are great questions. It's, and you could see as I start going, get your people, I'm, I know there's probably a few people like, okay, you've already lost me. I thought this was a beginner class. So that's what I'm trying to, <laughs> I don't want to go too far down these rabbit holes, but they, there are, this is filled with rabbit holes. Okay. So let's move on now to complete the final side of our color wheel. I'm actually gonna start up here with the yellows and work my way back to the blue because if I start with the blue, I'm gonna have to use a whole tube of yellow to lighten my color back up again. Okay, so let's take our cool yellow. I'm gonna paint that in here, number 15. Okay, just get a little bit of texture. You don't have to, but. on my second one here as well. Okay, so once again, and this, talk about how, how blue 
transforms the red. Blue transforms the yellow super, super fast. So let's just take some of this cool yellow. I'm going to put it to the side. Zoom in. Okay, and now we're taking our cold blue. This is my uh, cyan blue. Uh, what would be another different cerulean blue? Let's take just a little bit of it. That was, in fact, that's quite a lot. I probably won't even need that much. Let's just take a bit off to the side. Mix it here. All right, that's... I mean, that was that's maybe one grain of salt worth of blue into this yellow. And... Boom, we are in the greens already. Right, and if I wanted to lighten this up, I would probably just wipe my paintbrush off and then come in and do that, right? But this is for our purpose, that's fine. You don't have to be that subtle, but it just shows you blue or is going to transform most colors very quickly. And yellow, because it is the lighter color, is very susceptible to being altered very quickly. So let's paint this. I'm just going to make it a little bit thicker. It's a pretty thin coat of paint. So let's do this again. Let's keep on marching along the color wheel. So we've got our yellow. Let's add more blue to it. Now, you could see, you saw when we did this one here, our number 14, like that was 99% cool yellow, 1% warm or cool blue, right? These are both cool colors. 99% cool yellow, 1% cool blue. For this next color, this is going to be maybe 75% cool yellow, 25% cool blue, just because of how dominant that blue is. Now these these greens we're painting right now. This is a super saturated uh, green. Like it's it's a, a very candy colored green. I like it a lot, but it's also very rarely used. Like if we like, I mean, if we're painting a landscape, we would be putting this in the background and probably it would be a, a reflection or something somewhere like it's it's so dominant that you just want to be careful about how you use it okay ah i just see in the comments deborah says i'm working on a 20 inch by 16 inch painting by James Gurney, the one that we did in class, but I'm adapting it a little. I can't wait to show you folks. That is awesome. Uh, that would be really cool to see. That would be awesome. Yeah. Okay, so now let's just continue. So we've got this green here. Let's add a bit more blue. You know, quite a lot more to it. And now we've got this really nice color that if we were to take this and add white to it, we would start getting a, a bit of a teal quality to it. Right, because the more blue we get into this, um, into this green, the more 
uh, it's going to have that that teal quality. Oh, and there's Ravi saying hello. Hello, Ravi. So we've got the whole band back together. Okay, I'm gonna wash my brush for our final color for today. So now I'm just gonna take my cool blue right out of the tube and I'm gonna paint it there's the color wheel that I did using the template that I drew on paper and then used I scribbled on the back transferred onto the canvas worked beautifully and here's the one that I I did using the template that's provided to you free on the Dropbox so both of them at this point you know do basically the exact same thing I think um, you know, now that I've got these here, what one thing I might just use is a Posca pen, just to do the 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 black edges here, or to to do the text. Sorry. So I'm just going to zoom in and quickly. Uh, how should I do this? Mm -hmm. So what I'm using right here is called a Posca pen. Uni Posca is the brand. In fact, I'll just put a... So Posca pens, you know, this it's acrylic paint that's inside this paint, this pen. And they are really helpful for doing very fine details especially if you struggle with your paint brush trying to kind of get details this is sort of the a great little hack I guess you could say that will make your life so much easier so let's go over here Now you can still see a little bit of my the text that I wrote um, when I did the the transfer. If I had done had a little bit of a thicker white, you wouldn't be able to see this text much, if at all. You know, some of the places where I put thick paint on, they're still a little bit wet, so you just want to be careful. Uh, 
about getting your hand on those wet surfaces. So like I'm just stamping paint out right there as I mention it. But worse comes to worse, if you do stamp paint accidentally around, you can just paint over it with a little bit of white, let it dry, and you're good. I think I'm going to blow dry this, and then I'm going to write my numbers back over top of all those colors. Just You don't have to do any of, of what I'm doing right now. You don't have to do anything I'm doing at all. But I think just for when I use this next class to refer back to things, I can just say number one, number two, etc. And people are like, oh, I know what he's talking about because I can see it right there. Um, okay, <laughs> so let's... So just looking at an older comment here, Pascal said, um, uh, first time I start with my new set, I think I'll do a full color wheel to help understand my colors. So absolutely, I, I strongly recommend if you do buy any new tubes of paint, just like me, before you set out just to start making your painting, try just mixing it. Right, because this is what was so funny about this is I hadn't actually done this kind of thing in years. I've been teaching it, but then I, again, I was traveling and I went and bought some tubes. And I, just before I started that painting, I'm like, you know what? I tell my students to do this all the time. Let me just, you know, walk my own talk. And I did it, and, and I'm like, whoa, that purple is not what I want. Thank goodness I did it because I could have been painting for days and then been like, what on earth? What's going on here? By mixing it, you just you can see very clearly what every color does when it's mixed with every other color, right? Because what we're going to be doing next class is we're because right now we've just mixed our warm red with the warm yellow, right? When we know these are the colors that result from that, right? That's why I did that little line in between. We know what happens when we mix our cool yellow with the cool blue, right? These are the colors we get. And we know what happens when we mix our cool red with our warm blue. These are the colors we get. But what colors do we get when we mix the warm blue with not the cool yellow, but the warm yellow? This is what that's going to tell us. right? What color do we get when we mix the warm red, not with warm yellow, but with cool yellow? That's what that line is going to tell us. So we're going to do all of that in the next class. But I think just seeing this is really helpful. This is the, the, the where we begin, because now we can see what the most saturated colors of our color wheel are going to look like. And if, like Pascal said, you mixed one of these colors and they looked really brown, they, didn't, they don't quite have the nice saturation that my colors do, then that would tell you that assuming you're trying to replicate what I'm doing and, and, and all the paintings that we make together, that there's a there's a problem with one of the colors that you suggest that you've picked well not a problem it's just that you're not going to get the same level of saturation in your mixes that i'm going to get so you might find that the paintings you you get are going to look a little bit different than the paintings that i'm making which you know there's nothing wrong with making a painting looks different than my painting but if your goal is to try to 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 get close to what i'm doing then it helps you diagnose the actual reason why that has happened. I 
just zoom in just so you can see what I'm doing here. And even just like kind of writing these numbers on here, like in, in some way I'm thinking to myself, you know, I, maybe I should not have done this because what can also be helpful is just seeing how opaque certain colors are. Like we can see some of these colors, let's say the, the cool yellow, it is, it's very transparent. I can still see the, the number 15 right through it. But you could see some of these other ones. Look at the cool blue. I mean, like where, what number is that? It's number 11 but it's pretty hard to see that. And I'll do maybe a little bit of outlining. I'll write the neutral core next week when we get to that point. Look at it. what a beautiful color wheel. I'm so happy. <laughs> so last, this is what we did. This is the color wheel that I, I painted in when we did this a year and a half ago. Right, it looks pretty good. You know, it's uh, it's also done on, on one of these stretched canvases from the dollar store. But uh, I think here I'm getting closer to to something that I think is maybe a little bit more straightforward when it's all done anyway. <laughs> so you've probably, if you watch some of the older videos, you'll see me pulling that off the wall to explain some things. Maybe I'll still use that. I don't know. We'll see. Who knows? I don't have to make a decision right now, do I? Um, um, wow, a lot of comments here. Pascal says, I guess it's okay. I'll have to adjust the colors I have in hand. It's better to be aware of it. Yes. Yes. Right? So that's, I mean, as long as, if you could see that, and then if you're okay with it, then that's fine. You don't need to have the color wheel like I have. But if you're, but it's a way to diagnose and see very clearly what the results are. Awesome. V voices. I haven't painted in a long time either. I'm loving this. That's cool. Um, let me see. Deborah says, Rick and I have been painting with you, Michael, and we both have our own color wheels now. We have been using Windsor Newton paints, and we are not getting the same purple as you, Michael. Interesting. Surprisingly, by just adding the white to the colors, I'm getting closer to the color that I want. Yes. So that will you'll probably be able to lighten up those purples if you're not quite getting them. I mean, that's what I think I mentioned before. We could add a little bit of white to these and you would see the purple there as opposed to being so dark. But there is, the, and so that's something we're going to talk about next week because there are different whites, right? In fact, I've got a bunch of different acrylic whites here. I'm not even going to go into this right now. But here's, these are all different whites that do slightly different things, right? So, yeah, I won't, I won't talk about that right now because I don't want to confuse everybody. Um, usually, we just need the titanium white, but I will explain a little bit to those in the next class. Um, Donna, uh, Donna says, that's a beautiful color wheel. Thanks, Donna. And Ravi says, some artists look at color pigments, numbers, and then try to buy single pigment paints and mix them as needed. Yes, you can go to the art supply store and buy exactly the colors that you need. Some artists do that. I, I, um, I would just so strongly recommend, for a beginner artist, I think that's uh, that's that is a very dangerous path to follow because I think you'll get confused very quickly. Like this, this is after a couple of years of teaching, and I think it is, as far as I can tell, like the even just my own experience. Like when I was went to art school, we did not do this. We did like what James Gurney was talking about, and the teacher would say, "Here's these colors, and go buy these," and you're like, until 
years later when I started teaching absolute beginner painting and like, okay, I'm like, how do I teach this to somebody who's never painted before? And I found, started kind of cobbling together my own system and realized, wait a second, this makes so much sense. Now I understand what my teachers were saying, but I, and I, why didn't we start with this and then go to the much more complex systems if you wanted to? Or, we, I mean, you could do anything with just this. So, I don't, I, 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 your guess is as good as mine as to why I'm one of the only persons on the planet who teaches people how to use this system to get started. Anyway, <laughs> I died. It's, uh,. For me, it's just very exciting because it's it, as a teacher, if I can figure a method out that can help the major, the the more people get into painting and and overcome all of the obstacles as quickly as possible, then that's a relief. And if it can help me improve my own paintings and my own understanding of color, then that's even better. <laughs> okay. So I think we're, I'm going to leave it here for today. There's, um, I think I wanted just to show maybe a little bit just quickly about cleaning paintbrushes. Because if we're done painting for the end of today, what do we do? There's a few things just as like little housekeeping things. You know, when, when I'm done painting, there's a few things that you can do, you don't have to do, but what I like to do is I like to try to preserve these. If there's a lot of extra paint on my palette, rather than just throwing it out, one of the things that I do is I just, I've gotten these little jars. These are, I think, from Amazon. They're little plastic jars. They came clear, but this is how much paint has often been left over or in tubes of paint. And I'm just going to scoop this out. And I, I want to be careful that I'm not scooping the part that's that I mixed paint in. Because I don't want to contaminate that jar with a whole bunch of other colors. I just want that original color in, right? So I'm not going to do this with all my colors. But maybe I'll just, let's do one more here. So here's my cool yellow. And it looks like it did get a little bit contaminated in there. Right, just put that in there. It might be just the paint separating. I'm not sure what that is. Anyway, you can. So what I'll do is I'll just go around and I'll I'll put all the excess paint into those jars because why not? If this is just going to go either down the sink or into the garbage, it's just a waste. And I always <laughs> say like when I see people throwing paint out. Like, there's the part of me as an artist is like, oh, it's like a, there's, you know, a painting that never had a chance because you've thrown it into the garbage, right? Anyway, so that's how I preserve, how I just get a little bit more mileage out of my paints. And for many of you, you know, you don't have a lot of money, so you, any way you can save the paint, the better, right? Now I'm just going to clean these brushes. So I've had a few brushes here, right? This is the brush that I used to paint my white off at the very beginning, right? I put it in the water for sitting in the water for an hour and a half. That's okay. I don't want to leave my brushes sitting in the water overnight, right? So I have right here, do not leave your brushes sitting in the water overnight. If you leave your brush sitting in the water overnight, I think I've got one here that I did that very thing to. I don't know if it's clear. You can see that it's kind of bowed, right? It's kind of curved. And actually, when I took it out of the water, I've accidentally left it by the sink there. It was sort of like a, literally had like a, you know, a J shape or the top of a, of a lowercase f, right? And that can severely destroy your brushes if you if you leave them like that. So you want to kind of clean them in as, as soon as possible. So I take this is my water that I've been cleaning brushes in throughout today's episode. I don't want to use that again. Here's usually I would do this under the sink, um, not right here on my table, but it just 
I don't have a camera <laughs> over the sink, so I'm just gonna show you a little bit what I'm doing. Right, you can see the difference now. Because I've cleaned it in my jar and I wiped the paint off on a rag, there's there's really no paint, no paint coming contaminating this water, so it's not really changing that much. But here's a few things that I use. So Dr. Broner's, I use this kind of stuff. I like this because, you know, one of these things, I think costs like 20 bucks, but you can, you know, what I did is then just took this little soap bottle and you, you put like maybe, you know, what, uh, an eighth of this in here and then fill the rest up with water, give it a good shake. And then here's what I, I do. I just take a little bit in my hand And then I just take my brush, rub it around in my hand like this. All right. It's really so I'm so I'm getting the any excess paint that was on there, but the the, the main thing that, that kills brushes is paint that sneaks up the bristles and gets trapped up here. This metal piece is called the ferrule. And especially, you know, if you're after over the course of time, this will start to harden up as more and more paint builds up there, no matter how much, how well you clean your brushes. But I just sort of do this, throw it, I, then I would just rinse it underneath the sink. Let's just do this other brush. Now, this might seem like overkill. But if you want to save your brushes and you want to be able to use the same brush for years, right? Some of those brushes, that, that, like this brush, not maybe not this one. I think this one's newer. But there are brushes that you've seen me painting with for over a year and a half that I bought in a set for like $8. All right? Um, so there's that. There is other... And I would just rinse that. Actually, maybe what I, would, I should do is just show you. I would rinse this off. All right, just quick, we'll gently dry it. Now, I've shown before that I have this little brush caddy. All right, let me just zoom out here. All right, and I can just let my brush sit like that to dry overnight. Actually, I just got to plug this camera in. One second. So just be, <laughs> class is almost done. I just want to get these little uh, things. So what's great about this is I don't, doesn't really show up too well on camera, but you see all the brushes, they're slightly angled down. So even if there is a little bit of paint that is stuck up in here, a little bit of that gravity will help just kind of pull it or let it kind of work its way out. I think probably, it's not the worst thing you could possibly do, but if you're storing your brushes like this right after you wash them, then now you've you've sort of loosened up some of that paint that might be there and then it's going to soak kind of drip down into the metal and then harden and dry again so it just makes it, it helps accumulate that paint in here which slowly kills the brush and you might find you have if you, you might use take care of your brushes really nicely but they just start getting progressively harder and then you, you have just the tip that is still useful so if you don't have anything like this is just something I made I keep I'll, there's a link to it I'll, I'll put in the description to the artist who, who created this and showed how to do this online but if you don't have something like that then literally what I would just do is just take let's say um, a couple of things like let's say I've got you know something of two slightly different heights Right, and I could just set this like that. Probably wouldn't want to do that on tape, but let's so let's see. It might be something 
again, like these are slightly different heights. Just something. You can see why this is so much more helpful, just like that. And that way, if there is some paint that didn't get washed out, it's gonna slowly try to at least work its way. It might not, you might not come back to it tomorrow with like a little pile of paint, but that would be ideal, All right? So ideally, as the paintbrush is drying, it's on either a slope. There are things you can get for like 50 bucks from an art supply store. Where you can kind of like with a rubber kind of that sticks your paintbrush up and it will hold it and let it dry vertically. That's great too, if you want to spend 50 bucks on something like that. Um, but whether you need it or not is up to you. Uh, and just lastly, just before I finish, I mentioned this in the previous episode, just when it comes to cleaning, maybe I'll just use this. This is this brush cleaner. This, the Masters brand and let me just use the same paintbrush we just used. It's this, it, it claims to be, and it does, it, it works kind of nice in that it's, um, uh, it's, it's got a little bit of like a slightly, con it, it's co got a conditioner, it says, right? So we, you rub your paintbrush in there and then you just do the same thing I was doing with the soap, right? And then just, I guess, uh, where's my water, my rinsing water, right? And then you just, but what's kind of nice is you will find it, it just has a slightly softer kind of quality than it might have had before. Um, you just want to be careful about using any type of soap that's got like a lotion or cream. Like, you know, like some hand soaps will say, you know, it's got um, aloe vera in it or something. Those are great for washing your hands but you don't really want to be coating your paintbrush with any sort of lotion or cream because that is going to come off and get into your paint and who knows what kind of effect it will have. You know, something like this, uh, the other one I really like of this same brand is the tea tree, oil, tea tree oil version. It works really great. Um, Ravi says, I have a waste paint canvas I put uh, leftover paint on and make some kind of abstract art, something like that. I feel bad to throw paint in the sink. That's awesome. I often, here's something I do as well. A little. Sometimes if I got extra paint, I'll just kind of smear it on here because later on I can peel these off and then use them as textures in paint if I want, right? Rather than wasting a bunch of paint to build up that texture, I've got that paint that was otherwise wasted that I can just use and glue onto the surface of a paint, painting, paint over it, and no one knows that it was that extra paint that I put in there. Um, let me see, I think that's everything I wanted to cover for today's episode. Yeah, okay. So, next class, we are going to be taking the color wheel to the next level. We're going to be doing mixing all the colors that go in between all these colors, what we call like the inside or the spokes of the color wheel. We're also going to be talking about how to mix your own browns, how to mix your own skin tones, and how to mix your own black. Notice we haven't talked about black. You can buy black. I have black. I rarely, rarely use black. Um, that's just my own. I, I think as a beginner artist, knowing how to mix your own black, I think is super, super helpful. Right? Whether or not you use it or not is up to you, but knowing that you can do it, I think is essential. So thank you everyone for joining me again. There's no class on Thursday for some of those of you who've been painting along with me for the past couple of years. But there will be, I think, the week after. Because the, this, you can't believe how it's so nice taking a little bit of a break. My first Thursday off in almost two years. Thanks for your understanding and patience as we get a whole new group of people going. And before long, they will be as experienced as you. And we'll have another group of very, very um, advanced artists. So 
Anyway, if you enjoyed today's episode and you want to help support the show, there's a link to PayPal down below. You can use the Super Chat function here in YouTube. You can also send a check or e-transfer by contacting me through the Facebook group or my website. Both of those links are down below. I encourage you to join the Facebook group. You can even take a photograph of your color wheel in development now or when it's done next week. We would love to see what you're working on, what you're passionate about, what you're interested in, and what you really want to get better at. Right? That's what this is all about. So enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone. We will see you guys next week, same time, same place. Hit like and subscribe to the notification bell so you know when the new videos are coming. We'll talk to you again soon. Take care, everybody. Have a great night. Bye-bye.